greetings to all of you in Crossworld Bulacan and other Crossworld churches. We're greeting you from Bacolod City, from Trinity Christian Fellowship, and we thank the Lord that um, even in the midst of what's going on around the world and even in our nation, we could continue to worship the Lord together with you in one spirit. Let's continue to lift up each other and uphold one another in prayer as we continue to seek the Lord and believe that God is moving mightily in His churches today. We thank the Lord that even in the midst of uncertainty and in the midst of this um, lockdown and um, COVID season, we know that God's Spirit is moving because He is working in order to purify the church and raise up an army that will do great things for the Lord in the last days. And following the theme of your church, getting to the other side victoriously, I would like to share with you from Joshua chapter 3 that talks about the crossing of the Red Sea. I would like to entitle the message, Time to Move. So I would like to encourage you, if you have not yet read Joshua chapter 3, please do so and know what was going on in the life of Joshua and the Israelites as they take the step of faith in order to move into the Jordan River and all the way into the Promised Land. And so there are a number of things that I would like to share with you as we look at the experience of Joshua and the Israelite as they cross the Jordan River. You see, the crossing of the Jordan River was very important in the life of Joshua because at this moment, he just took over the leadership of Moses. And this was a hurdle for him and the Israelite in order to enter the Promised Land. And so the crossing of the Jordan River is very significant because it will mark the step of faith of Joshua and the new generation of Israelite as they believe in the promise of God and claim the Promised Land that God has given them. And so the first thing that we can learn from Joshua and the Israelite is that they have to move early. The Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 3 verse 1, Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Akasha Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they crossed over. You see, moving early is very important. Sometimes when we receive a word from the Lord, the more we think, the more we logicalize, sometimes fear begins to creep into our heart and it keeps us from moving. In the Bible, we read that every time a, a man of faith in the Bible receives a word from God, immediately the person takes action. In the case of Abraham, we remember that when God instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, the Bible says early the next day, Abraham took his son to the, to the mountain where he's going to sacrifice Isa. So moving early is very important, especially when we receive a clear instruction from the Lord. Fear is very crippling. When a person gives in to fear, that person, that person cannot move according to God's plan and purpose. In the midst of this COVID season, where many Christians are overwhelmed with fear, it keeps them from moving according to God's plan and will because they are crippled by the uncertainties of the times. As we look into the life of Joshua, we know that Joshua just took over the leadership from somebody who was considered a great man, a great leader, and a great prophet. It's understandable to know that probably during that time, Joshua was struggling whether he's cut off for the work or he could measure to his predecessor. And that's why in Joshua chapter 1, as the book of Joshua begins, we read that the Lord spoke personally to Joshua. In verse 2, the Lord said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, can you think for a moment that God said, my servant Moses, the greatest prophet, the greatest leader that Israel has ever known, is no longer here. It's your time to rise up. It's your time to take his place. And the Lord continued, Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. And every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. So from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. And verse 5 says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And God assured him, As I was with Moses, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And verse 6, God told Joshua, Be strong 
and of good courage. For this, to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Now this phrase, be strong and be courageous or of good courage, was not just mentioned once by God to Joshua, but three times throughout chapter 1, the Lord reminded Joshua that he need to rise up, he need to be strong, he need to be courageous. And that's why in verse 7 again, Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do everything to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. And do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And in verse 9, again, the Lord told Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage and do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So we can see in Joshua chapter 1, three times the Lord told Joshua, be strong and be of good courage or be very courageous. That's why courage is very important if we want to move according to the will and the plans of God. You know, the more we delay, the more we will fail to carry out the will of God. And that's why every time we receive a clear instruction from the Lord, it's time to rise up. It's time to take courage. It's time to move. But secondly, the Bible reminds us not only should we move and move early, we need to sanctify ourselves. In verse 5, Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Whenever the presence of God is in the place, God moves in wonders. You know, sad to say, in our generation, many times, people are more focused on the move of God rather than on the presence of God. It is not the move of God that simply confirms the presence of God, but it is the presence of God that brings about the wonders of God. And so, many Christians are kind of lost what they are focusing on. But Joshua reminded the people, the reason why they need to sanctify themselves is not because of the wonders and the miracles that God will do, but because of God's presence in the place. And that's why more than the wonders and the manifestation of miracles, people like us, Christians, should be running after the presence of God. In a generation where people focus on the external things, and sometimes focusing on the external things may lead to extreme things. So Christians today are more focused on what they can benefit in being a Christian, what they can receive in worshiping the Lord. And they have lost the concept that the joy and the blessing is in the fact that God is with them. And that's why if we want the presence of God in our midst, we need to sanctify ourselves. I believe this is a season of sanctification. The Lord is sanctifying the church because the church today our focus on numbers, our focus on external things. Yes, we hear a lot of stories about church growing, but sometimes we have to ask, as the churches are growing, is the kingdom of God growing as well? Is the church bringing people out of the world, or is the church simply bringing people in from other churches? So that's a challenge for us right now, because God wants to sanctify His church so that the church can be used in order to bring the lost into the kingdom of God. And that's why Joshua reminded the people, sanctify yourselves. You know, when we come before the presence of God and when we, when we worship Him, it's very important to come to Him with a pure heart. The Bible says, who can come to the presence of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And so as we believe that God's presence will be with us when we worship Him, we come before Him with a pure heart. The world today is focused on numbers as well. People see numbers as a measure of success. And it's easy also for us as believers to think of success in our church in a measure of numbers. But I believe during this COVID season, whether a, a church is a mega church or a small church, it no longer matters, especially during lockdown, during times where assembly cannot happen. And God is reminding us that He is not after mob or crowd. You see, the crowd mentality involves people doing something that they see other people are doing. And that's why whenever we see riots or rallies, you know, you kind of wonder how many people there really know why they are there. You know, probably personally, I'm suspecting that only 10, the most 20% of the people in the crowd know why they are there. The rest are there because they have friends, they have nothing to do, 
or some are even even paid to be there. And in the church, we cannot afford to just simply be there because others are there. God's desire is to raise up a church where people are faithful. And that means if God has to filter, have to sift the church, have to shake the church in order to bring the remnant out, then he will do so. Because God's desire is for multitude one day that will worship before the throne of the Lamb of God. And multitudes are those who wear white clothes, worshiping the Lamb, who have overcome the world. That's the vision of the Lord for the last days. And only the remnant can bring in the multitude because the remnant are the faithful people. The Lord reminded me that we talk about faithfulness, but the only way for a person to be faithful is great faith in the Lord. You see, faithfulness is not dependent on us. Honestly, we can never be faithful. We will always fall short. But we can be faithful when we put our faith in the Lord, when we know who our God is. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 22, the Lord said, The least of you will become a thousand, and the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will do this swiftly. So here we can see that God gives importance to the list, to the remnant, to those who are faithful. Because from the few, from the remnant, the Lord can raise up the multitude who will worship Him and serve Him. And so that's why we need to sanctify ourselves. We need to purify ourselves and be ready for whatever God is going to do. Third, let the Lord lead you. In verse 6, Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. In fact, if you look at the structure of the Ark, you will begin to see that it's like a throne. It's like a throne where the Lord is seated. And that's why the cover of the Ark of the Covenant is also called the mercy seat. When you look at war movies in the ancient time, usually you know who the king is because that king is seated and that seat is being lifted or carried up by his servant. In the same way, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. It represents the seat of the Lord. And so when God instructed the people to have the Ark of the Covenant cross before the people, he was reminding the people that your victory is not based on your strength, on your numbers, on your power. But your victory is dependent on me. And so the Lord is the one who moved ahead of his people. In fact, again and again, the Lord will remind Joshua, I will go ahead of you. And throughout the Bible, we see how the Lord will go ahead of his people. So by the time they reach the battlefield, the war has been won because it was the Lord who fought for his people. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47, as David was facing Goliath, this is what he said, This assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear. Then he said, For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David's confidence in facing Goliath and raising the army of Israel against the Philistines is the fact that he knows that the battle is not his, but the battle is the Lord's. And because the battle belongs to God, then he knows that the victory is his. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, we are reminded, this is the word of the Lord to Jerubabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, the battle that we are fighting is not our battle. It is the Lord's battle. And because it is the Lord's battle, we know what the outcome is. God will be victorious. Even in the seeming hopelessness, we know that God has won the victory. In fact, the greater the hopelessness, the sweeter the victory. Because when we see the desperation, when we see how hopeless things are, then we know that the victory can only come from the Lord not from us. And finally, we need to step out by faith. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know 
that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And to make the long story short, after the priest came to the Jordan River, the Jordan, re the Jordan River um, receded and they were able to cross over the Jordan River. So if you were in the place of Joshua and the Lord gave you the instruction to tell the priest to bring the Ark of the Covenant and step into the Jordan River so that the Israelites can pass through, I believe it will require a great deal of faith on your part to believe in the Word of God. What if nothing happened? What if everything failed? But Joshua had assurance that God reminded him as he was with Moses, just like the time when Moses led the Israelites through the Red Sea, God told Joshua, I will be with you as well. The parting of the Jordan River for the Israelites to cross over is nothing compared to the Red Sea that I have parted. And therefore, this will remind the Israelites that just as I was with Moses, so am I with you. And so when we begin to step out by faith, we move from the standpoint of victory. We may not see the outcome. We may not see the victory. We have the Word of God. We hold on to the Word of God. And by faith, we are able to step out. And that's why the Lord reminded Joshua as he was telling Joshua in chapter 1, Be strong and of good courage. In verse 8, the Lord said, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. What is the basis of our faith in the Lord? The basis of our faith is on the revelation of God concerning Himself to us. It's impossible for us to know God on our own human wisdom or knowledge or understanding. For us to know God, we need to have that revelation from Him. And that's why the Word of God is God's revelation. If we want to have a strong faith in the Lord, then we need to know the Scriptures. We need to read the Word of God. Sad to say that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible prophesied, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, and instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn aside away from the truth and turn aside to myth. If you read the prior verses, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, you are going to see that Paul challenged the believers to preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. Paul was telling the believers, you have to know the scripture. You have to know the word of God. Your basis of faith does not depend on what people say. Neither does it depend on your experiences. The basis of your faith is in the word of God. Why? Because a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And this COVID season actually have exposed a lot of teachings. At the same time, it brings about danger where people will begin to choose whom they will listen to and what they will listen to. Today, with the online services going on, because many churches are still in lockdown, and with the many preaching that's circulating around us, it's easy for us as Christians to justify our spirituality by listening to podcasts. Some will say, at least I don't spend my time on Netflix. Instead, I listen to preaching. But this is my challenge, and this is the reality. No matter how many preachings you listen to, if you are not reading the Word of God, it is false spirituality. Because the Bible challenges us that it is God's Word that really matters. I always remind the people in church, it's not enough for us to listen to sermons or preaching. It's not even enough for you to listen to what I'm saying. You have to go back to the Word of God and read the Scripture for yourself. You see, there are many false teachings that are circulating around. In verse 4, the Bible says they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. Last Sunday in church, I shared at least four things that people are turning into, which we have to be aware and which we ourselves have to evaluate whether we are succumbing ourselves to those teachings. Number one, prosperity gospel. People today are believing that being a Christian would bring prosperity and blessing. 
Now, I believe that our God is a good father and he knows how to bless his children. However, the problem with prosperity gospel is the fact that the focus of serving the Lord and worshiping him is on the benefit that one can receive. So the problem now is people may not be Christians because Jesus is Lord, but rather they are Christians because they want the benefit of being a Christian. And so the danger with, with this is that when challenges come into their life, when they experience a little trouble or problem, they begin to turn their backs on God because all the while they are expecting prosperity. They are expecting material blessing. The second problem or myth is the hyper faith. The hyper faith believe that anything that you claim in the name of Jesus, you will have it. And so that's why sometimes people will jokingly say, Oh, I like this motorbike. I like this car. So I lay hands and claim it in Jesus' name. Name it, claim it. But the problem is, we have dismissed what the will of God is. As much as we believe that faith moves mountain, but that faith should be based on the purpose and the will of God. When we ask for something, God answers our prayer. But His answer may come in different ways. There, were, there are times that God will grant us our prayers. There are times that the Lord will not grant us our prayer. But there are times as well that the Lord will ask us to wait for the right time. So hyper faith easily dismisses the sovereignty of God. We believe that God is sovereign. We believe that He has His plan and purpose and will for each one of us. In fact, I like what Romans chapter 12 says. That the will of God is good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because many times we think we know what is best. But in the end of it all, we are reminded that only God can see the beginning and the end. Only God can see what is best for each one of us. The third myth is hyper grace. And hyper grace teaches that since our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, there is no need for us to confess our sins anymore. Because anyway, it's forgiven. So the problem with hyper grace is that many Christians take the grace of God for granted. They take the sacrifice of Jesus for granted because they think that they can sin as much as they want. Anyway, they have already been forgiven. But the Bible clearly tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Why is there a need for us to be purified even as believers? Because sin comes between us and God. Sin causes us not to be able to hear the voice of God. Sin causes us to become numb to the presence of God. Hyper grace teaching will say that first, first John chapter 1 was not written to believers. My problem with this is that first John is a letter that was written to a specific group of people. When you write a letter, you don't write a letter dividing one portion for a group and another portion for a group. Besides, you don't see any clear demarcation line between these two groups of people. You would rather write one letter for this group and another letter for this group. So I believe 1 John was written to believers, reminding them, that the forgiveness of God and the cleansing of God is always available. And so we are not perfect. And so every time we fall short, every time we sin, we can always confidently come before God and receive His mercy. And the fourth myth is this. Only prophets can tell you what the will of God is for your life. We are living in a generation where there are so many people who have called themselves prophet or people who have become self-proclaimed prophet. And many believers, because they lack the knowledge of the Word of God, they want the easy way. They want to run after prophets to receive word for themselves. But when we go to Joshua chapter 3, we see that even there, the Lord clearly told Joshua to go back to his word, to go back to the book of the law, to get instruction from his word. You know, Moses was considered a great prophet. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, since then no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to the whole land. Despite the fact that Moses was a great prophet, the word of God 
still take precedence over the words of the prophet. In fact, there was one time in the book of Numbers chapter 11 that God's presence came upon the elders and they began to prophesy. But there were two who remained in their tent. They did not go out with assembly. But the Lord's presence came upon them as well and they also prophesied. And the people were troubled because they feel these two were not worthy because they didn't go out with the rest. And so Joshua, son of Nun, raised this matter to Moses and he said, My Lord, stop them. But what was Moses' reply? In Numbers chapter 11 verse 29, Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord will put his spirit on them. It's very clear in the mind of Moses that the reason why people can prophesy is because the Spirit of God is upon them. And we're familiar with the prophecy in the book of Joel that in the last days, God will pour out His Spirit upon all people. And young men will dream dreams and old men will see vision. And the Bible says even among the women and the men and the children, God will put His Spirit upon them. And that prophecy has been fulfilled. When Jesus died and and rose again, every person who put their faith in Jesus Christ received the Spirit of God. What is the Bible reminding us? The Bible is reminding us that we have the Spirit of God, and therefore, the Lord speaks to our hearts. You know, every time somebody prophesies to you, this is what I believe. The Lord is simply using somebody to confirm a word that He has already revealed to you. I believe that the Lord will not reveal to somebody His plans for you that He has not first told you. And that's why people who run after so-called prophets are in danger because they easily receive the word. But the Bible says even with that, we have to test the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29, Paul said two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what is being said. In the New American Standard Version, it says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. You know, in the Old Testament, when a prophet speak and he, the prophet says, thus says the Lord, people take it as a word of God. They can either receive it or they can reject it. But in the New Testament, it's very interesting that Paul said, let two or three prophets speak. And then he said, let the others pass judgment. The reason why we can pass judgment is because all of us have the Spirit of God. And the same Spirit that speaks through them also speaks to us. Therefore, we can confirm whatever word that the Lord releases. This is the danger that people are facing today. The prosperity gospel caused people to have a self-serving faith. The hyper-faith belief or teaching caused people to have manipulative faith. The hyper-grace caused people to have a cheap or abused faith. And finally, those who focus on a prophet-centered kind of faith have a displaced faith. So we are reminded, as we take the step of faith, our faith is based on the Word of God. Because it is the Word of God who leads us and directs us. And the Spirit of God will speak to us according to what the Lord has revealed already in our heart. And that's why as we look at the story of Joshua crossing the Red Sea, we are reminded that Joshua has a long way to go. He has lands to conquer. And the Lord reminded him that as I was with Moses, I will be with you. But only take hold of my word and do not depart from it, but meditate on it day and night. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Therefore, if we want to cross over to the other side victoriously, we need to hold on God's word. We need to be ready to move by faith in the promise of God's word. In the season of crisis that we are facing, we know that there are so many things that we are hearing that we no longer know what is the truth, what is real, what is fake. Even in the COVID situation, we don't know for sure what the real score is. But the Lord is reminding us, that it is a good season for us to really evaluate where we anchor our faith, where we draw strength from. May it be that we anchor our faith in the person of Jesus Christ, because the Bible says He is the author and finisher of our faith. And may it be that we receive instruction from God that is based on the Scripture, because we know the Word of God is unchanging. And though everything will pass away, 
but the word of God will last forever. Let's pray. Lord, we come before your presence, O God. We thank you that in the midst of this shaky times and uncertain times, we know that there's one thing that is certain. You are our foundation. You are the rock that is immovable, that will never be shaken. And when we put our faith upon you, the foundation, our lives will not be shaken as well. And we can stand firm. And so today, O oh God, is our prayer that every person will understand that this is a season in which you're asking God to look into ourselves and see what kind of faith we have. Because only faith in you, only real faith, can cause us to move to the other side victoriously. We thank you because you are in control and you are sovereign of all things. And we can always trust you that even in uncertainty and hopelessness, you are victorious. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you and may your faith increase and may you arise to shine for Jesus in the midst of this dark and uncertain times.